So uh, it's a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to be here in Vancouver, to be uh, back at the Board of Trade. The last time I spoke here, you gifted me a great history book that I read, and uh, having finished it, I thought it was time to come back. <laughs> but thank you for, uh, for inviting me, and uh, I'm going to speak about infrastructure, but I'm also going to speak more specifically about uh, LNG and pipelines and terminals and coastal access and the energy corridors to the Pacific, and you may find some of the comments that I make uh, to be controversial. I should just begin uh, in saying that um, I was born in a, in a place in Canada by the name of South Porcupine, and often in politics I would uh, begin speeches by pointing that out and saying the great thing about Canada is that you could actually come from a place called South Porcupine and be taken seriously. <laughs> um, and it always would inevitably lead to side jokes about why is there no North Porcupine. Um, but uh, I would never actually have a chance to introduce myself in that way. But after the speak, where I would get out of the room before somebody would grab me and say, hey, I'm from South Porcupine. Today I didn't even get a chance to do that because it happened actually at my table. And uh, Tracy Reddy's, as it turns out, was born in South Porcupine. <laughs> Uh, the campaign, the length and breadth of Canada, on the slogan that South Porcupine wanted in Tracy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as a Canadian, when we uh, when we think of nation building, the first mental image that usually uh, comes to mind is that old sepia colored photo of uh, the characters in the stovepipe hats, <coughs> surrounded by onlookers at Eagle Pass uh, near Revelstoke driving uh, the last spike into that 4,000 kilometer railway track that had been laid down across mountains and prairies and uh, through some pretty unforgiving wilderness. And it's useful to sort of reflect on that as we talk about nation building infrastructure because back in 1875, the Prime Minister of the day, William Alexander Mackenzie, said this and I quote, he said, it will not be completed in 10 years with all of the power of the men and the money of the British Empire. So history, you have to say, judges his comments as being pessimistic because the CPR was actually finished not in 10 years, but in five years, and it changed uh, our country forever. And so Canada really has benefited from those kinds of ambitious projects over the course of our history. Projects like the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Trans-Canada Pipeline, uh, the James Bay Hydro Project, Bennett Dam, Hibernia, the Trans-Canada Highway, and others. And they were all transformational, all transformational to this country in their own way. Because each put its own <coughs> unique commercial stamp on Canadian progress, prosperity, and our development. Now these projects all had uh, things in common. They all took years to build. They all created massive employment while they were being constructed. And they all had incredible spin-off events. And they were financed with private and public sector monies and they stimulated the entire region of this country. And of course, each in its day was subject to intense scrutiny, and they stoked uh, public debate and controversy. And if you think about it, that really is the nature of developments that are big enough to change the fortune of the country. And it's worth uh, reaching back here in Vancouver as well to remind ourselves that Vancouver was actually selected as the western terminus of the CPR from a number of sites that were presented as alternatives on Burrard Inlet. And even then, uh, the key criteria that made for the decision to choose Vancouver was sufficient deep water to accommodate ocean-going vessels. And so from day one, Vancouver was meant not just to be a railway town, but it was to be a great and vibrant port city. And it was not just to be the end of the line, uh, in this sense, but it was to be the gateway to and from the Pacific. And so this was to be the city in many respects where Canada was to start. And so it's also worth reflecting back that uh, in that same summer, the same summer that the very first passenger train arrived in Vancouver on the CPR, the very sh first ship arrived in the newly constituted port of Vancouver. And that ship, ladies and gentlemen, came from China. So businesses and investors here in British Columbia have ever since really recognized the, the importance of the Asia Pacific. And Vancouver and Canada have benefited from that awareness and from that connection. 
But I think it's fair to say that most other Canadians, and really for much of our history as a country, have not understood that, and have not perceived the West Coast and Vancouver as Canada's front door. And so certainly, uh, that was the conclusion. There was a poll done, as I recall, in 2011 by uh, the Asian Pacific Foundation. They found that only 11% of Canadians strongly believe that our country is actually part of the Asian Pacific region. Only 11% of Canadians. And that perspective, I think it's fair to say, is out of step in the Canada of today and certainly out of step with the world of tomorrow. And it really does speak to a lack of understanding uh, about where Canada's future does lie. Because I believe that when historians look back uh, to the early years of the 2000s, they're going to identify a pivotal event that really shaped the course of the century to come. A single event that shaped it for the world at uh, large, but also in particular for our country. And that day was on September 17th of uh, 2001. Because that is the day that China signed the agreement to become a member of the World Trade Organization. And the events uh, that, uh, that triggered, uh, have been triggered since, the forces that uh, have caused ever since a tectonic shift in the balance of global power were really unleashed at that moment. And it was that shift that has moved China back from the periphery, back to the very center stage of world commerce and the world economy. And it's a shift that marked the beginning of what will come to be known as really the Asian century. And so what does that mean exactly for us in Vancouver and as Canadians? What's, what, what's the Asian century entail? If you strip away the rhetoric uh, that we so often hear and look at some of the numbers, it's quite telling. Consider the, uh, the forecasted growth for seven of the continent's largest economies, including uh, China, India, and South Korea. Together, those seven countries have a combined population of more than three billion people and a GDP of $15 trillion. But by 2050, it's estimated that those countries will account for something in the nature of 45% of the globe's GDP and they will account for 90% of global growth, 90%. And a look at uh, recent economic developments brings the future into even sharper focus. Urbanization in Asia. Urbanization in Asia is occurring at a rate which is unprecedented in human history. Across the continent, the urban population is expected to double to 3 billion from 1.6 billion today. And by 2025, there will be well over 200 cities, 200 cities in China, with a population exceeding 1 million people. And I sometimes uh, challenge friends and colleagues to name just five of those 200 cities. I challenge you to do that as well at your table after I finish my speech. <laughs> but to bring this even closer to home, consider that there are today 130 cities in China with a population larger than Vancouver. 130 cities. And so the implications of this growth are sweeping, and in many cases, they're staggering. So today, right now, uh, China consumes 45% of the world's coal, consumes 30% of the world's iron, consumes 46% of the world's steel, nearly half of the cement, 38% of the copper, 33% of the aluminum that's consumed in the world. It is the factory of the world, and it is the planet's single largest consumer of raw materials. And so just take a moment and let those numbers sink in. And you can go beyond that to look at consumptive numbers. China has become the world's largest automotive market, producing close to 16 million vehicles per week. There are over 900 million cellular phones at work in China today. And the Chinese middle class is expanding so rapidly that it will soon be larger than the entire population of the United States of America. China, well, uh, having done all of this, uh, has resorted to importing to fuel its growth, not surprisingly. It has become the world's second largest user of oil, <coughs> second only to the United States, and it has become the world's largest consumer of energy. By 2015, some estimate that China will be consuming 13 million barrels a day of oil, and in terms of pure demand, that is 12% of what will be consumed in the world. And here's the key. 
China alone constitutes and accounts for 60% of the growth in demand for consumption of hydrocarbons from today going forward. And so if you think of the implications of that for the oil producing nations of the Middle East, and yes, for Canada, they are quite profound. So simply put, the rise of the Asian century and the demands of production in China and beyond will stretch the world's commodity markets to the very breaking point. Because between 2000 and 2010, Chinese consumption of all of the things that I've described, copper, aluminum, zinc, nickel, lead, grew at annual compound rates of close to 25% per year. And that pace carries on unabated. So to look at the Asian century from a Canadian point of view, we have the ability to become a supplier of much higher value commodities. And that is very much in Canada's future. And one of our competitive advantages will certainly be our ability to be a strategic supplier of oil and of natural gas to a rapidly expanding Asian marketplace. <coughs> and so as a country, we have very compelling reasons to seek a, a more comprehensive and strategic energy relationship with Asia and reasons to seek an even closer relationship with China. And I say this today for two reasons. Firstly, because the United States, while they are our closest ally and our dominant export market for energy, the growth of the Asian economy and the ensuing energy demand open up the door for Canada to become a trusted supplier and a reliable provider of energy products to China. And the incremental demand of tomorrow is not American, it is Asian, almost in its entirety. China now depends on foreign oil for slightly more than half of its supply. Those statistics are increasing to 2015 by a 70% dependency on foreign supply of oil as it will for other products such as coal, where the Chinese today consume 45% of the world's production. And so helping China meet uh, its needs will create jobs and income for thousands of Canadians, propelling our country to greater prosperity through trade. And China has made it quite clear, they made it very clear in the discussions that our governments have had, that energy security will drive their growth and that they will wish to ensure that. And so Canada can play a significant role to assure at least some of that security of supply through both our exports of oil and also our exports of liquefied natural gas. A second reason um, which we need to look to today is the lesson that we have learned as Canadians as a result of the recent U.S. decision on the Keystone XL pipeline. It's imperative for Canadian oil producers to diversify their customer base. Nothing could be clearer for us as a country. Today, both uh, Canada's crude oil and our natural gas sell in the United States at a discount to international prices. That, that happens because we have only one customer for our exports. We don't do this with any other commodity, and frankly, we should not do this with our valuable hydrocarbons. A 2011 report by the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council attached a number to this. By having only one customer for our oil, Canada effectively leaves an astounding $28 billion on the table each and every year. <coughs> That's $28 billion in lost Canadian corporate revenue and the associated federal and provincial taxes, which refract right across this country to every single provincial government. And so the message I think that we take from that as Canadians is quite clear. Having one customer just doesn't cut it any longer. And so unless we diversify our energy markets, we will remain a price taker. And the dream that we've talked about in terms of Canada being an energy superpower will remain exactly that. We will remain as a continental supplier at discounted prices. And so we have every reason to pursue this course of action. But increasing energy trade with China is going to be a little tricky if our energy products are stranded and we can't reach see. And so I believe it is in our long-term interest to develop multiple corridors to the Pacific for our crude oil and equally so for our natural gas. And I say equally so for our natural gas, not just because of the importance 
of that industry to British Columbia, but also to China. Because natural gas is the cleanest of the fossil fuels and it can play an extremely important role in terms of reducing China's large and continuing reliance on coal production uh, and coal-fired electricity generation. Now, our bank has been quite engaged in this debate. Uh, we re recently released a report on LNG entitled, The Race is On. And we believe that uh, natural gas is one of our most undervalued commodities on the global marketplace, and that export prices will only strengthen in the future. So this is a British Columbia story. And as a country, we benefit from one of the shortest supply routes to the Asian market, shorter actually than Australia's. And much of the gas that we will be exporting will go to China, but also to markets like Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and beyond. And that gas will come in part from British Columbia. And the various proposals that are before you as British Columbians to develop LNG uh, facilities on British Columbia's west coast will bring significant economic benefits to the province, to the natural gas producing regions of your province, and to the country as a whole. But let's be clear, and let's not sugarcoat this in any way. As critically important as it is to our shared future, the development of Pacific corridors for oil and liquefied natural gas stand as perhaps the most challenging initiative that our country has encountered in decades. I noted previously that uh, building nation-building infrastructure has often stoked public debate and can be controversial and divisive, and that is certainly true of the debate of British Columbia surrounding Pacific Energy Corridors. Now, I tell you, I will tell you frankly that I support the development of uh, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, and other access points to the West Coast. But this debate is actually much larger than simply a question of the support of opposition or the support of a pipeline. We're indeed speaking of the need to, for leadership to define and deliver what is in the national interests of Canadians. And so I applaud the, the Prime Minister's recent visit to China and his unequivocal support for Canada's need to diversify its energy market. I think you know what he said, I quote, he said, the government is committed to ensuring that Canada has the infrastructure necessary to move our energy resources to these diversified markets. And so ladies and gentlemen, this is really a defining moment for Canada. And the federal government has an important role to play. But they're not the only one that has a role to play. Because we will also need engagement uh, from the British Columbia government from British Columbia's First Nations, and of course, <coughs> the private sector. And so what is the way forward? What do we do from here? Because these are tough issues. Arguably, these are the toughest issues, and in the post-Keystone era, we are all in what is essentially uncharted territory. And I would say that the, the constitutional and legal issues that surround West Coast energy corridors, terminals, and shipping are extraordinarily difficult. And the way forward hinges uh, upon negotiating a way through this complex overlay of unresolved First Nation land claims and unresolved environmental and infrastructure questions. These are probably the most difficult public policy questions in Canada today. And to expect that Enbridge or frankly any other corporation can resolve those in the context the single National Energy Board hearing is unrealistic. Firstly, the constitutional obligation to consult with First Nations is not a corporate responsibility. It is the federal government's responsibility. Secondly, the obligation to define a, an ocean management regime for terminals <coughs> and for shipping along the West Coast is not a corporate responsibility. It is a federal government responsibility. And thirdly, these issues cannot be resolved by regulatory fiat. They require negotiation. The real risk, frankly, the real risk in all this is not regulatory rejection. The real risk is actually regulatory approval undermined by subsequent legal challenge and the absence of the necessary social license. That's the risk. So in light of that, how should we move forward? It begins with leadership. 
Our reality has changed in recent months with the U.S. decision on Keystone. And so West Coast access for Canadian hydrocarbons was always important. It was important when I was in government. But it's now critical. It is critical to Canada's national interest at this point. And to advance that national interest, the federal government needs to take the lead. They need to consult. They need to negotiate. And they will ultimately need to exercise their legislative authority as a majority government. So firstly, uh, Ottawa must step up and more effectively consult with First Nations on the unresolved land claims that blanket British Columbia, in particular northern British Columbia. Because energy corridors will need to be secured on a non-derogation basis, allowing for development without forcing First Nations to relinquish unresolved issues. And while the National Energy Board can assist in this effort, can aid in this effort, it alone <coughs> will not be able to get the job done. Senior negotiators will have to be put in place to assist in those consultations. Second, Ottawa has sole jurisdiction over our territorial waters. So it is going to have to be Ottawa that takes the lead in developing a management regime that will take into account the rewards as well as the environmental risks of increased West Coast tranker traffic. And legislation will ultimately be required. And so too will contingency plans for unforeseen events. And it's going to be essential, given the importance of these waters to coastal First Nations, for the government to pursue a co-management regime for those waters, together with the government of British Columbia and the coastal First Nations. Finally, thirdly, Ottawa must permit the National Energy Board hearings to unfold and conclude as needed. And this process, is going to take some time. It may indeed take several years. And it needs to be conducted and completed at arm's length with all of the players receiving a proper hearing. To be sure, it needs to be expeditious. But if it is forced, if it is rushed, or if it is arbitrarily constrained, it will not withstand subsequent judicial or public scrutiny. And so, at the end of the day, the bottom line really is this. Developing pipeline corridors to the Pacific uh, will take much more than money. It will require leadership, it will require patience and time, all of which need to be invested. And only then will meaningful dividends truly be achieved. And I would say today here in Vancouver as well that consultation is a two-way street. And it is equally important that British Columbia's First Nations sees the opportunity that this represents to embrace Canada's agenda while at the same time advancing their own. And so really, uh, as I come to a close, I would say that the Asian century marks uh, a great opportunity for Canada. But we need to be willing to do the hard work required to take advantage of all that and to engage in the heavy lifting that needs to be done. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, on that day in Revelstoke that I referred to at the beginning of my speech a long, long time ago, um, as the ceremony began to mark the railway's completion, this is a little known fact in Canadian history, but the first swing of the mall missed the, the mark and it resulted in a bent spike. And uh, it was quickly removed and a second spike was put in and that one worked, it's sort of a typically Canadian story. But there's symbolism uh, in all of that. Because nation building is never an easy exercise. We don't always get it done uh, on the first swing of the mall. It takes dedication, it takes courage, it's going to take leadership and drive, and it's going to require perseverance and determination. And so today as a country, we really stand on the verge of an exciting new period of uh, unparalleled growth. No other country in the world is bringing on energy projects on the pace and scale of Canada. And so a period of sustained prosperity lies ahead if we develop our resources, diversify our markets, and reorient ourselves towards the new Asian Pacific reality. And this is an era which a country that has so long gazed east to the Atlantic looks upon today. And we have to visualize the world as it will unfold. And we need to be a leading nation in the Pacific Asian century. And so as we celebrate the uh, nation builders of our past, we have to remind ourselves that our young country is still a work in progress, very much so.
the job of building Canada is never really finished. Thank you very much, ladies.